People were calling the police on 111 and they were hustling Posey Parker out of the event and she was being attacked by trans allies all over the place. We saw the police were in fact there, but they were not anywhere near where the violence was occurring and they made no attempt whatsoever to stop the violence. Welcome to The Shack with Dialer, Jill. Thank you for joining me on the podcast today. Well, thank you, Michael, for having me. Yeah, it's a pleasure. Now, you're Jill Evans. Now, who is Jill Evans? What's she all about? What's she done? And um, where's she coming from? Well, I've, I've been politically active since... Oh, the first memory I have is in the fourth form when I wrote a poem that was very patriotic and it went somewhere along these lines where... We're Kiwis, we say, and we're proud of that fact. We display it in similar ways at home or the flicks or the pub before six. We're Kiwis for all of our days. And then it finished up with, so USA and LBJ, stay away. That was, of course, in the middle of the Vietnam War. I then went to the University of Auckland in 1970, which was um, a buzz with uh, gay liberation. We went to a gay liberation dance and women's liberation, Germaine Greer came to our campus and spoke and of course it was the Vietnam War and so we are the generation that ruined the capping parade because we had a float with all these students dressed in as peasants uh, with blood all over them and we walked up the Queen Street singing all we are saying is give peace a chance. So. That was my sort of university career. I was there when Tib Shabalt put paint all over the the American embassy and we were down the bottom and there was all these police dogs, which was very frightening. Uh, I don't know which I was more afraid of, was the police dogs or getting arrested and having to tell mum and dad, because I was only 17 at the time. Um, So then um, we went to live in America and I was involved in, Uh, the anti-nuclear movement there and um, Nicaragua. We had Latin American solidarity and we used to um, campaign against the white train which was taking nuclear weapons from Amarillo, Texas to either the east coast or the west coast where the Trident missile submarine bases were. And where I lived in Coffeyville, Kansas was the point at which the train either went east towards the east or towards the west. So we were part of a telephone tree that we would tell all the activists further up the line which direction the train was coming so that they could protest. So then um, I went to University of Kansas to study journalism. And while I was there, I got a call from a telephone network that the train was coming through Kansas, through uh, Lawrence, Kansas, where the university was. And so I thought, oh, this will be a good story because we had a university newspaper. And um, I wrote up the story. Uh, Some people were lying on the tracks and had to be shifted off by the police and all this sort of thing. And afterwards, it made the front page of the University Daily Kansan. But I got called into the editor's um, office and he asked me how I knew that the train was coming through Kansas that night. And I said, oh, yes, because I'm part of the state steering committee for the anti-nuclear movement. And he said, well, I don't want you ever to write about the anti-nuclear movement again because you're biased. And that was the attitude in those days of the media. You had a strict wall, really, between your activism and what you could write about. So he, so he, he wasn't saying the paper wouldn't report on it. He, he was saying that you won't be reporting it on that's that right. paper. That's yeah. right. On uh, that issue. Yeah, yeah. That's on that issue, yeah. yeah. And and sort of fast forward yeah. mm, Fast forward to, to now, where yeah. are you now? Well, so I was in the Alliance political party and then um, I went to work for the Service of Food Workers Union, which is Labour affiliated, so I got involved in the Labour Party and um, I was on the state, on the uh, council of the Labour Party and very active in Auckland. I was the Auckland Women's Network Coordinator. But they were putting up remits, and when I say they, I'm talking about the rainbow sector, which had been captured by the trans activists, trans allies. And um, so they put up remits such as 
transgender surgery or gender reassignment surgery needed to be made more um, accessible and equitable. And so we at a women's hui in Auckland of Labour Women, we wanted to put for those over 18 as an amendment. But we weren't allowed to put that amendment up. The hierarchy of the Labour Party came down on the facilitator of that particular session who had put the amendment through for consideration, for voting on, actually. It never got voted on because she was prevailed upon to pull the amendment. So it went through without any age restriction. And there was other similar things that were happening at the time around um, remits to do with availability of public toilets. And we wanted to add, particularly for women and children and people who are older, as well as the original remit, which was about people with disabilities. As soon as I went to put the amendment, somebody it was on a Zoom meeting, somebody said, oh no, stop now, because women's toilets is code for transphobia. And I went to say, well, that's not actually what our consideration was. It's just that when, I didn't get to say this, but what I was going to say is that when architects design public facilities, they always put the same number of male toilets in as women's toilets. So you see the men coming in and out at Wellington Airport when you land from Auckland, but, uh, there's a huge queue for the women's toilets. I didn't get to say that because they muted me. And um, I was absolutely furious about it. And when I tried to come back on, they muted me again. So I was literally silenced, you know. So, and, and the, so this is the Labour Party of New Zealand. Yes. And right, and they're, they're not allowing you to put forward what are obviously very reasonable Mm. Um, propositions. That's right. Yeah. And you've also had um, you know, a career in the union. Um, That's right. In, in unions, particularly um, unions associated with work that a lot of women do. Is that correct? Yes, that's right. I was originally, well, I was originally in the PSA. What, what's the PSA? The Public Service Association. Yeah. As and that, that's, that's the union for the public service. Exactly, yeah. yeah as a delegate when I was at State Coal Mines doing public relations and we got corporatised, actually by the then Labour government yeah. under Preble, um, and Longy was the Prime Minister. But anyway, I then went to work in the uh, Polytech system and I worked for AIT, later AUT, as a journalism lecturer. And through that I became ev eventually the President of the Association of Staff and Tertiary Education. So I was in that union and um, I'd finished my term as president and became an organiser in Auckland for them when um, I got asked to come and join the Service of Food Workers Union, which is predominantly women because we worked in women-dominated industries like cleaning and food services, for example. And so uh, at the person who was the regional secretary at the time said if I wanted to do something for women workers I should come and work for the Service of Food Workers Union. So that's what I did, which was a Labour affiliated union and how I became involved in the Labour Party. So I left the Alliance at the time. Um, I was actually the President of the Alliance at the time. Right. Um, but anyway, so I, I was in the Service of Food Workers Union for several years when we joined with the EPMU, which is a male dominated union. EPMU is? The Engineering, Manufa Printing oh, yeah. and Manufacturing right. Union. And the interesting thing about that was, coming back to single sex toilets, was that we moved in together in Auckland and we had women's toilets and men's toilets and then they decided to make the disability toilet into a gender neutral toilet. Uh, I don't know what people with disabilities think of this trend, but that's what's happening. But in Wellington here, we moved into the EPMU building and it only had one set of toilets, which we were to share with the men all, most of the people that came over from the Service of Food Workers Union were women organisers and clerical staff, backup staff. 
Uh, we were not asked if it was okay that we had to share the toilet with the men. Furthermore, my partner, who is a, was a union organiser at the time with the Service of Food Workers Union, he didn't feel comfortable either having women in the toilets. It wasn't a question of safety. It was just a question of, these are your male colleagues. And you don't really want to be sitting in there in the cubicle <laughs> and coming out to wash your hands while your male colleagues are going in to do their business too. So, yeah, so anyway, uh, that was just one of the things, but... So, so, so you've, you've had a long history in unions and, and you describe yourself, obviously you're on the left mm. with regard to, to the Alliance Party, which is a, you know, was a left party. And, um, and Labour Party, which is New Zealand's left party. Um, and, but now you've actually formed your own party. That's right. So yeah. just after this business with um, the remits that went through the Labour Party, and then we had the Labour Party conference in Auckland in November of 2022. And actually I forgot to mention that I was lobbied by some um, young men from the rainbow sector to ask us to change to support their remit to change the constitution that would have taken away women's it wasn't a quota but it was a target that we would be 50 percent oh i think it actually was a quota mm. at all levels of the party and i said no way go and ask the men for half of their for some of their 50 percent why should we give up our hard-won rights anyway so i was already getting disillusioned um, with the Labour Party. So, sorry, sorry, just that. And the, the rainbow community is, is basically what uh, lesbians and gay men and um, mostly young um, gay men, but yeah. um, captured definitely by the trans allies within the Labour Party. Right. So there's not so not not necessarily trans people who are no who identify as trans. No. So so they're they're heterosexual people that. Ha uh, uh, sort of doing someone else's bidding? Um, my impression is they've recently been through the university sector and very inculcated in queer theory. Um, I wouldn't say most of them, uh, uh, probably s some of them identify as non-binary and so on. Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying that all gay men support transgenderism mm -hmm. either, mm -hmm. by any means. But, but Yeah, th these are the people that mm -hmm. who are asking you, yeah, okay. And just to say that at the time in the Labour Party, on the Women's Council of the Labour Party, the rainbow rep was actually a transgender a man identifying as a woman in a relationship with a woman who was the environment rep on the Women's Council. Right, so a man identifying as a woman in a relationship with a woman. And right. both of them on the Women's Council. Because, obviously. because he was a woman. Yes, but also pushing that agenda. So yeah, yeah. the one who was the partner, the woman who was the partner, she's the one who shut, accused me of code for transphobia. Right, right. Yeah, right. so the... She, so she's a mind reader. Well, the women's council was totally captured. Yeah. So you're obviously not enamoured by what's going on. And so you've started this party. Do you want to tell us about well, what, what the party's called and, mm. and why you started it? Probably would never have happened had Posey Parker not come to Australia and New Zealand. So we were watching what happened in Melbourne and what happened in just, Hobart. Just describe who Posey Parker is. Oh, uh, yeah, Kelly J. Minchel, Minchel, who is an activist from the United Kingdom, who started her own party called Party of Women, but this was after that. So we were first, actually. Yeah, OK. And so she came to New Zealand and there was a lot of pressure from the trans allies. Uh, sorry, sorry, what she is and what, what's her, what's her oh, stake? Oh, right. She's, she's very much um, a, a man cannot be a woman. No woman has a penis. Right. That's her stance. It's very unequivocal right. and out there. Right. And anyway, so she's very controversial, obviously, for those opinions. And she came to New Zealand and there was an attempt by the trans allies to stop her entering the country. And Michael Woods, who was then a leading cabinet minister in yes. the New Zealand government, mm. came out on the media and said she shouldn't be allowed to come, but they couldn't stop her. 
he, he was probably the Minister of Immigration at the time. Yeah. And so anyway, so she came to New Zealand and um, probably, in my view, somewhere bet- close to probably 2,000 trans allies turned up to try and shut down the Let Women Speak and event. How, how many people were at the Posey Parker event? Probably no more than 150 of us. And uh, they're all women? No, not all women. But there was m- men there as but well. Like 90% women sort of thing? Um, yes, or although some of us did uh, bring men along yeah, to yeah. because it was known that it was you know because we'd seen what happened in Melbourne yeah. and what happened in Hobart and unions were present as well, including my union, which is called Air Two, which was the one that joined with the service of workers of the EPMU. So they were there yeah. waving their flags. The unions and. In support of Posey Parker or no, against? No, against? absolutely so, not okay. on the other side. And and just one other question. The, the age group of the women attending the Posey Parker event? Oh, well, most of us were um, similar to me in age, 60s, 70s. Yeah. Um, my friend, uh, who's 10 years older than me, so she's 80 on a, on a walker, bought her son and her grandson, who's a rugby player for the... Auckland Blues so that's the sort of thing that was happening because it was anticipated that there would be trouble and and just one other thing about the group I'm I'm imagine a lot of the women a woman like yourself who have a, a long history of uh, in feminism and promoting women's yeah. uh, rights absolutely yeah okay because we come from that age group that came out of the late 60s early 70s yeah where we were fighting for you women's rights. So sort of classical feminists in yes. a sense. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Okay. And then what happened? Uh, so And it was in, in Albert Park. Albert Park at the Rotunda. Now the Rotunda in Albert Park was a site of political activism, possibly going back before I was at university, not that I was aware of that, but in this early seventies, that's where we used to have uh, political activism. Tim Shabolt used to come and and every Sunday there was, uh, there was, you know, people would be there, and there was music and all the rest of it. And uh, actually, at one stage, we all got chucked out of Albert Park, and then we had to come back and reclaim Albert Park. So anyway, so we turn up, and there was two rows. There was a, a barrier fence uh, of not very strong, and inside that, about a meter inside, was a string fence. And I assumed, as did others, that that's where the police were going to be, to form a barrier between the trans allies and ourselves. But there was no sign of any police anywhere. And I then said to others around me, I feel... Sorry, there were no sign of police anywhere? No. And had the police been notified that it was going on? Yes. The police had known there was a whole... Uh, the organisers had met with the police liaison team. It turned out... And, and also just the context that P- Posey Parker had been in, the, in Melbourne and it, it had got violent, is that correct? Yes, but they had police on horseback. Yes, and, yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and, and violent in the sense that trans activists were being violent to um, women attending yes. Posey Parker's event. Though amongst those trans allies there was uh, far left sort of groups, mm. there was the usual trans allies but, of but young what, universities. But what I mean is that the yeah. violence was one way or two way? Well, no, it's not two ways. Yeah, so, it's, so it's going from the trans activists yeah. to basically being violent to um, yeah. classical feminist women. Yes. Okay. Okay. So, yeah. so, 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 so then we saw that there were no sign of any police. I said, I feel like we're sitting ducks here. Uh, but anyway, so... Uh, it was a long time before Posey Parker arrived, and when she arrived, the, um, the trans allies pushed over all the barriers, which were easy to push over because they weren't that strong, and they just started surging forward. And I actually went over to say, you know, you're not, this is not on, and started arguing with them, but then um, thought better of it, and anyway got pushed back towards the rotunda. So, so what, when you say argument, was it... Um you know, nice and calm, or was it quite heated? I was trying to tell them that uh, this, you know, not to come forward. Mm. 
And how, but did, they they, weren't how, how did they respond? Oh, they, they weren't listening. And as it turns out, a lot of them had earplugs on because the thing mm. about their yeah. protest is it's extremely loud. Mm. They come with really, really loud noisemakers. And anyway, so uh, when Posey Parker arrived, you know, she got doused with tomato juice but no one knew at the time what it was, what mm, the product mm, was. Mm. And uh, people were calling the police on 111. And um, later, when we saw the video of the event, um, as they were hustling Posey Parker out of, the, out of the event and she was being attacked by trans allies all over the place, we saw the police were in fact there they had parked their van over by the university on Princess Street and, um, and people have told me that there were a couple of police on the back of the activists under trees but they were not anywhere near where the violence was occurring and they made no attempt whatsoever to stop the violence. So once the violence started the police did nothing? Oh well, no, they didn't even do it. Yes, that's right. There was no sign of them. And I was beside a TV3 crew and I was yelling to them, where are the police? Where are the police? And the camera, oh, no, the reporter said, I know, it's crazy. None of that was on the TV news, of course. Right. And just so just to um, drill down on the specifics, the trans activists, what sort of age were they and were they men or women or combination? They were both and quite young. So right, so they're mm. young, mm. and then then essentially they're getting violent to middle-aged women. Well, older, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you might say older women. Oh, older women, yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, they continued to make this noise, which was very disconcerting, and I still cannot watch those videos. I have to turn the noise off mm. because it's so loud. Yeah, we left. Uh, while Posey Parker was still on the rotunda. After about half an hour, it was obvious no event was going to take place. So did she attempt to speak, even though she'd been down? No, she was trying to get hold of the police to get support right, to right, leave. Right, right. But no one was coming. And so were people injured? Yes, there was. I, I didn't see it. Mm. And I think it occurred, or no, it occurred at the time when the barriers were being pushed over, because I have seen the video. Mm. And what happened is that uh, one of the women saw a young woman picking up the, the, um, the rope barrier that was there and pulling it down. And she went over to her and then next thing a guy came up and she got hit from behind, she staggered and then this guy just punched her several and, times and how, in the face. how old was this woman? She was 70 something. So, so a young man came up from behind her and punched her? Yes, she got hit from behind and then she got punched in the face. And I, I did see her. Wow. On, she was still there and I saw a big, her with a big black eye, which got a lot worse, of course. He subsequently did get caught and was taken to court and was let off discharge without conviction on so, the basis that he wouldn't be able to get a job uh, and, and that he had neurodiversity. Right. That's what the judge said. Right. So, now, you, so, 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 in a sense, you, you can get off a crime because you may not be able to get a job for hitting an old lady. Most people cannot get off on the basis of that. Right. It was purely, well, it, it looks very Right, so, so you, had a, you had a combination of the police standing back mm. Um, not doing anything and then you had the judicial s system standing back and not doing mm. anything. So is that, is that correct? Was, yes. was anyone else um, brought to trial and convicted? No, though there is still ongoing litigation over the woman that doused, or man, right. a man that doused right. Posey Parker, a man who identifies as a woman. Uh, and well, has let's just call him a man. A man, yes, mm. and he has pled guilty and um, waiting for sentencing, which I think is in September. But anyway, that night right, of that event, right. I left, I was really quite furious, um, which is probably a good thing of why I left. I was furious with 
uh, the, the Labour government because I believed that a message, a political message, had gone to the police not to intervene. That was my belief. People do, do you have any ground for that belief? No, uh, and yeah. people tell me that they would never interfere like mm, that. Mm. But the signal was definitely out there. Um, and just in your, you, you, it's not obviously it's not the first protest you've been to in your life. You've been to a mm. number of protests, protests, I imagine. Was the police, the behaviour by the police, typical of other protests you've been to? Or Absolutely not. I described the one that where Tim Shabot put the paint over the American embassy, and they were there with police dogs snarling at us, pushing us back off into the uh, the grounds of the bank. Where right. So you, your experience in, of protest is police generally separate the two sort of factions of, of the protest if there's any sort of contentious events going on. Is that correct? Yes, that's co that's so, correct. So but this this. Um, out of all the protests you've been to, this was an exception. Absolutely, and it turned out that the police liaison person that was in charge is, in fact, a man who identifies as a woman. So, and that's in the police force. And have you spoken to the police and made any complaints? No, I didn't. No, but sorry, has ha have there been complaints? There have been numerous complaints. And how's the, how have the police reacted? Um, by and large, people got soft pedaled responses. I didn't because I was traumatised by the whole thing. Mm. On the Monday following the uh, event, I actually rang the platform, which is a New Zealand alternative um, web-based show, and I, to I was saying how traumatised I was, and if you listen to that video, I sound like a really old person, like in my 90s, because my voice is shaking. I didn't work for an, a week after that. I was so traumatised by it. But that night, because I blamed Labour, because they were part of stirring up the trouble, there's no doubt about it. Well, it was, you had a Minister of the Crown yeah. um, essentially taking a side, which their role is not to do that. that that's unconscionable. And, and uh, some of the, uh, you know, the deputy... Prime Minister Grant Robertson put out an email along those lines. There was other cabinet ministers putting information they, out. Yeah, they they don't they, they don't have any rights to speak as Crown. They could speak as individuals, I imagine, but not as ministers of the Crown, um, weighing in on public. Um, I don't know what the term is. But, you know, yeah. yeah, so also amongst the trans allies was Green MPs too. Marama Davidson got uh, hit uh, on the pedestrian crossing. There was a group of motorcyclists that went by, Marama Davidson being the deputy, or not deputy, co-leader of the Greens. So when you say she got hit, she, she was on which side of the... She was on the pedestrian crossing. No, no, but... but oh, was she, she was on the trans allies side. Right. Along with other MPs like Chloe Swarbrick, so who's Was now, Chloe Swarbrick there then? Oh, yes, yeah. definitely. Yeah. And they were all on the trans allies side. And Marama uh, claims that she got hit, though she wasn't hurt, by a motorcyclist who went by... It was nothing to do with our crowd. Right, okay. It was a Destiny Church group that was in the, um, which is a far right church group, mm. that was had uh, a rally at the same time in another venue, right. and a group of their cyclists went by. Nothing right. to do with us, but Marama made it all about herself. So anyway, I was so furious that I, um, I that night decided to leave the Labour Party had sent them an email saying I resign forthwith and I was talking to a friend of mine who was also very active in the Labour Party and she had been an elected local authority, you know, we call it local boards in Auckland, um, and she was an elected Labour person on local boards for a number of years and she and I had both held senior positions within the party membership. Anyway, so we were talking all that night about what to do. And the options were not to vote in the upcoming election, which we didn't think that that would prove anything because no one would know we didn't vote. And so by the end of that same night, March the 25th, 2023, 
we decide to form the Women's Rights Party. We put out a call through Facebook and 20 women came on the following Sunday and we resolved that we would set up a political party, that we would go for registration of the party and we would call it the Women's Rights Party and we also resolved that we would not um, become part of the party of women that Posey Parker was talking about setting up at the time. The reason for that was because New Zealand, we have our own electoral um, system, which uh, being mixed member proportional, MMP, means that you can stand a list of candidates and you don't have to contest electorates. And you could stand that list across the whole country and that would be a measure of uh, support for women's rights it also, we hope, would send a signal to the Labour and the Greens that um, there were a considerable number of women of the left who were not going along with this. As it turned out, we got, uh, you had to get 500 members by July, which we did. We got a constitution, which you need to have. We got a party platform, policy platform, Agreed. We had a conference in June in Wellington here. So, so essentially, you're all up and running. Yeah. And and essentially, what are your your basic, um, you know, reasons for existing? What what are you trying to achieve? So, our what we were trying to achieve at that time was to be on the ballot to give people who had no political home an but, option on the ballot. Yeah. Form. But what I mean is, what 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 are your policies? Uh, you know, so brief, briefly. Well, our policies go over a whole range of issues that affect women. Mm. Um, obviously, sex-based rights as contained in law and policies. Um, also, the freedom to assemble and to speak and to hear people speak. Um, we're in favour of language that retains the difference between men and women, sex-based language. Um, but we also have policies around issues like childcare, prostitution, uh, surrogacy, uh, equal pay, pay equity. Uh, so it's basically mm, classical feminism again, isn't yes, it? Yes, yeah. except yeah. that in getting these 500 members, uh, and the only media that would give us any platform was the platform. Right. And it reaches um, an audience that would be not necessarily sharing our political alignment with the left. So the party itself is made up of people of all different political mm. persuasions. Mm. We actually have women in the party and men who have been and possibly still are supporters of national, except for the national being the Conservative government. Yeah. They're in government right now. And um, they would be supportive of the Conservative policies. Yeah. So we have to tread a fine line. There are a lot of people in our party, I don't know how many, but quite a few who on the, ele on the day of the election decided to vote for a party called New Zealand First, which is a populist party, that had come out and said that they would support single-sex spaces uh, as well as they would support single-sex sports. In other words, they would defund any sporting body that um, allowed men to p compete in women's sports. So on that basis, Quite a few of our members actually voted New Zealand First, which was a shame because no one knows why they voted for New Zealand First. Right. But had they voted for the Women's Rights Party, everyone would know on the basis of which they mm. voted that. Well, it, it is a toss up though, isn't it? Because uh, um, you ended up with having New Zealand First as part of the government, so they could then actually put pressure within the government. So yeah, it, 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 you know, voting is always a tricky thing. It's always a compromise and, and trade-offs, um, yeah. generally. It's the idea that people in New Zealand have not to vote for a small party that's not going to get into Parliament because that's a wasted vote. And the way the proportional system works is that the votes from parties that don't make it to Parliament 
essentially get uh, distributed between the parties that do make it to yeah. Parliament. Yeah. Yeah. And so uh, for that reason, you know, it's obviously a rational decision that people made, but I obviously tried to encourage them not to do that. Yeah. As it turned out, we got two and a half thousand votes. And by the time of the election, we had 750 members. Right. And we only got registered on August the 26th, 2023, and the election was only about six weeks later. Yeah. Just want to talk... Um, about well, the two things I want to talk about next is how the media media has treated you, and then I want to talk about the Law Commission's current review of the Human Rights Act. So, what's been the response from the conventional media? So, I when I was in the uh, union movement, I off I would put out press releases, and I was beyond. Uh, the Breakfast Show, I would be on... It's TV, all, it's TV One. Oh, yes, yeah. on the um, national television. Yeah. I would be on national radio a lot, um, and we would get articles printed in the newspapers. So right, so, so you, you're quite an experienced operator within the media, and the media liked having you on. Yes, and I should say that I actually was a journalist yes. and I taught journalism at AUT. So, uh, and I'm, I was also in public relations and a fellow of the Public Relations Association. So, right. a lot of people say, oh, you know, you need to um, get stuff in the media. Well, so what, we try. Yeah, so what, what's happened? So before before you started this party, you were in the media for on union issues, and I've seen some of the videos. It, you know, you're, you're great. Um, since you've started the party, what's happened? Nothing, I except for as I say, the platform. Um, so uh, so yeah. no, no 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 national no, no national broadcasters. The, the national paper, which is a Herald, that's just it's basically complete silence. Complete silence. So you put out the press releases, uh, and they just do not respond. So it's total blackout. Right. Why do you think that is? Um, because within the media, uh, at high levels, there is. Uh, they've just decided that they're going to make sure that no no one will report from the gender critical side. There is often articles favorable to people who right. support transgender okay. ideology. You get glowing reports of young girls having their breasts removed and how exhilarating what, be, and below, empowering. Be, below 18, um, the age of 18? Or, I mean, have there been reports, glowing reports that, that basically minors have done that? Um, I'm not quite sure because yeah. what I do know is that to get what they call top surgery, which is, you know, hides is it, is what it, it really is. It's a euphemism is. for a it's double a mastectomy. Yeah. yeah. You have to generally in New Zealand go private and I know a lot of crowdfunding occurs to get the money together for that surgery. Um, in terms of the more radical types of gender reassignment surgery, we don't like that term because you can't well, you can't actually make yourself, if you're a man, into yeah. a woman. Another 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 word is mutilation. Yes. But yeah. Absolutely. In fact, our members wanted to put that in the policy that um, that term, but we came to masculinisation or feminisation cosmetic surgery. Right. Is how we describe it in our policy, which right. was. Um, uh, yeah, was a, a compromise to not have words like mutilation in there, but it is mutilation. Um, but anyway, uh, there is a gender reassignment services run by Health New Zealand, um, and you have to be 18 in order to have your first appointment, yep. and you will be years waiting yep. to get the operation. Okay, so, so complete media blackout on the New Zealand Women's Party promoting women's rights. Okay, so that's interesting. Now, the Law Commission um, is doing a review of the Human Rights Act r regarding um, uh, uh, this issue of, of gender. 
um, transgender and so-called non-binary um, people. Mm. Um, for a start, I mean, what is what is transgender and what is non-binary? Well, they've spent 245 pages trying to um, argue in favour of, this is the Law Commission, of including gender identity and expression and innate characteristics of sex into the Human Rights Act. And so it's very clear that that, well, they, they come straight out and say that they've come to the conclusion from all the evidence that they've got that that needs to happen. Um, Sorry, can you just, just, just clarify, what, just say that all again. So wh what are they saying needs to happen? Ha they? So they're saying we need to, so in the Human Rights Act, which was derived from a Race Relations Act and then a, a Sex Discrimination Act, in 1993 those were put together and there were 13 grounds of prohibited discrimination. Well, that's how many there are now mm. because sexual orientation and another couple were added at the time. Um, and so you cannot discriminate on the basis of sex, for example, including pregnancy and childbirth, and marital status is there, and race, and religion, and all sorts of other things. So that's in our Human Rights Act, and then importantly, the Human Rights Act also contains a whole range of exemptions in which it is lawful to discriminate. For example, Section 46 says, that um, an organisation can uh, discriminate in favour of having a person uh, on the basis of sex um, in single sex space, in providing facilities for single sex. So, so a man can't go into a woman's changing room or toilets, that sort of thing? Well, you can, you, if you have men's and women's toilets mm. separate, mm. you're not in breach of um, the discrimination um, on any of the prohibited grounds because you can have women's and men's toilets oh, separate. Yes, 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 sorry, yes. yes, yes similarly, yeah, yeah. you can have a boarding hostel that is only for men or you right. can have a women's a a home, refuge. Yeah, or a homeless shelter, yeah, yeah. Mm. Okay, yeah, and that, yeah, that is not discrimination. Yeah. Um, but then if I said I'm not going to hire you because you're a woman, that would be discrimination? Um, generally. Yeah, yeah. But there are some exemptions. So yes. there is one about authenticity. So if the role, uh, say you were trying to hire an actor yes. for a man's <laughs> role, you could decline to hire a woman what, what, in that situation. What about midwives? The, the uh, 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 do, do you have to be a woman to be a midwife? No. Okay. okay uh, yeah. But the fact is that of the 3,000 something midwives in New Zealand, there's only a handful of them are men. Okay, yeah. And they generally are in management positions. Yeah. That was my experience. Yeah. They were not covered by our midwives collective agreement in yeah, terms yeah. of employed midwives. Yeah, that, but, anyway, so. But an example would be uh, when I. Men, uh, when I was on the Council of Trade Unions Women's um, Council as a co-convener, we had a hired paid women's official who worked for uh, the Women's Council and for the CTU and she decided that she would, first of all she was going to be non-binary and this is about 20 years Just ago. Ex explain what non-binary is. Um, so. I, I had to have it explained to me because 20 years ago there didn't seem to be much, you know, that was completely new to me anyway. So uh, she wanted to be referred to as neither male nor female, right. which did pose problems with the pronouns uh, because you, you wanted to use it, which seemed very <laughs> bad. But then uh, she went on uh, cross-sex hormones and rapidly became... Ex uh, presenting as a man and so then the question was could she continue to represent New Zealand working women both nationally and internationally in terms of the Human Rights Act uh, her sex is still a woman but if we put it as well as gender identity and expression she is not now expressing herself as a woman so uh, would would she now 
referring to herself as he and adopting a male name be appropriate in that role. And the legislation has an exemption that allows for that, that you can um, discriminate and you could ask her to take right. on a different role, right. which is what happened. So, and so what, what, are the, what does the Law Commission, go back to what the Law Commission is recommending? So they want to include, as well as sex, as a prohibited ground of, di of discrimination, they want to add gender, identity and expression and innate characteristics of sex, which is... What, what does that mean? Generally thought of by the general public as intersex, although uh, medically called disorders of sex mm. Uh, mm. development, and now because we can't talk about disorders, differences in sex development. These are very rare conditions, and... It's, a, it's something like zero, you know, 0.05% of the population or 0. something like that. Nor point nor 0.18, which would mean of the 60,000 babies born in New Zealand every year, mm. there would be around 10. Oh, really? That many? Yes. Right. Uh, okay. And in the past, there might have been um, surgery to reassign them as mm. one or other sex, mm. But um, generally, they are either male or female. They've mm. just something's gone wrong right. in right. utero, or right. later becomes apparent in puberty. And that's what is thought to be behind the two boxes yeah. uh, at the Olympics. So there is no evidence, though. There's a whole chapter on the evidence of why this is needed to bring in, based on a survey called Counting Ourselves, done by the University of Waikato, which is a transgender unit there. And, um, and this research was very dodgy. It is a self-selected survey of rainbow youth. It has 46% identifying as non-binary and um, an equal number of trans men and trans women. And just a, a, a trans man is a woman pretending to be a man. Exactly. And a, and a trans woman is a man pretending to be a woman. And only about a quarter of those answering the survey identified as one and another almost, yeah, the same number. So, so you're saying, saying the research is highly what? Um, suspect. I don't think and, it's even and, and, representative and of... The, yeah, and the Law Commission are, are using that. Yeah. One thing, I mean, I, I haven't, obviously I haven't read the 250 pages, but I've, I've read, um, you know, a, a little bit of it. And t when they were talking about definitions, essentially, they were saying some people think gender means this, and some people think gender means this. Some people said sex means this. Some people... Nowhere did they mention the science says. No. No way since it's been proven biologically that you know um, men are X Y or f females are uh, XX chromosomes, and I was actually find I found it quite shocking and very surprising, obviously, that the Law Commission is actually not using science to define biological terms. Well, that's the main concern, really. And and is that the case throughout the document? Oh, so, absolutely. So so, so, so it's. It's sort of, they're, they're using hearsay to define terms, in a sense. Yeah, they, it, it's completely biased. So it actually says at one place that the, some people think sex is binary, i.e. that there are men and there are women, and this is an opinion. Yeah, they also, yeah, they also <laughs> said in the West, um, you know, um, we think um, in the West it's thought that sex is binary, but it's not the case in other societies. Um, another another quote, um, uh, it says, person's gender identity can change over time. So, um, but they don't substantiate that with any scientific um, research. No, that's correct. And when and Helen Joyce went to China and she was working for the Financial Times, and she was on a, a researching as a journalist a, a, a topic completely separate from transgenderism. But she happened to mention it to some of the Chinese people there and they were like, what? Because they understand quite clearly that there are men and there are women. Mm. And there is a lot of rewriting of culture 
cultural history and culture as it is today. Uh, and I'll give you an example. In Samoa, there is a term fafafini. It means like a woman. And it is related to sex roles that become assigned to a boy. And, um, and he will perform some of the roles in their society that are typically performed by women. Now we're being told that Fafafini is a third gender, and you'll probably find many people in the um, Samoan community, young people in particular, who now believe that. Mm. But that is not what, and, and that's what, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's sort of, I find all this stuff quite Orwellian in the sense that they're rewriting language and rewriting history, um, and they're changing a very, in changing words that have had very, very strong uh, definitions, both sort of culturally and scientifically. Yes, and, well, the Human Rights Act talks about sex, as does most of our legislation. The Equal Pay Act, which is from 1972, never mentions gender. There is no such thing as a gender pay gap. It is a sex-based pay gap, and it's to do with the way roles typically performed by women in women-dominated industries um, are undervalued and underpaid within our society. It is completely about women being undervalued and underpaid, which can which uh, you know persists today. So there is no such thing as a gender pay gap. And if you look through our legislation at the time, gender has only started to creep in in um, legislation like the Conversion Practices Act and the uh, Birth, Deaths and Marriages. Acts. This is a relatively new thing. I should say though that in the 70s we did consider gender, meaning so socially constructed stereotypes, and uh, we did use that term to mean that. And so and that, that is really uh, what gender is about. The men who identify and claim to be women um, generally adopt extreme sexual sexual stereotypes, typical behaviour. Almost caricatures of, Absolutely. of femininity. No different than the people who used to put makeup on and perform minstrel shows and adopted blackface, which was as yes, being discredited. That's true. That's true. Drag queens <laughs> that have adopted... That's a very good point, which, which yeah, if, if anyone did that now, they'd be hung, drawn and courted. And drag queens do the same thing. We call it women face. Mm. We woman don't dress face, up right. with massive amounts of makeup. Mm. Uh, we tend to wear trousers. And the trouble with sexual stereotypes is that they change, sex stereotypes change over time. So in the 60s, women would wear dresses. And if you wore trousers, you... Uh, you wouldn't have worn trousers to work, for example. Mm -hmm. And when Helen Clark wore a pantsuit to meet the Queen, there was a lot of criticism of that. Mm -hmm. But over time, that sex stereotype has changed, and now it's perfectly acceptable most women would wear trousers. And so sex stereotypes are not enduring over time, and for that reason shouldn't be included in legislation, in my view. Mm -hmm. That also exists within cultural contexts. So that what is a sex stereotype in a typical Western society is not going to be the same as the sex stereotypes held in Iraq or Iran. Mm. So and within our own society, of course, we have a multiplicity of ethnic groups which would have different views about sex stereotypes. So that's the difficulty. Gender is a very imprecise concept. And, um, well, it has strategic ambiguity. Yes. Which is, it seems to be very useful for people promoting the, this ideology. And so chapter three of that human rights uh, issues paper that the Law Commission has put out uh, uses, relies almost entirely on this Counting Ourselves survey, which I explained is very dodgy in terms it's not representative probably even of the transgender community, because uh, I doubt very much that half of them identify as being non-binary. And they claim all sorts of discrimination in employment. 
one of which is that they can't get jobs because they're discriminated against at interviews. Well, I've been on interview panels numerous times over my career. I was at one stage the regional secretary, uh, a regional secretary of the Service of Food Workers Union, and I would interview for staff, organisers predominantly. Um, in that capacity on the interview panel, I can tell you that nobody would know why they didn't get the job because you don't tell them why they didn't get the job. You simply inform them they didn't get the job and they have no right to know. In fact, there wouldn't be anything in our notes even if we were discriminating on the basis of something. And I'll give you an example. I went for a job once when I was uh, actually in the process of leaving my then husband and coming up to Auckland to work from where we were living, and I applied for a job, and they asked me why I was applying for a job in Auckland. And they seemed to be insinuating that, was asking whether I was getting divorced. I said, you can't ask me that. I didn't get the job. But they re-advertised and didn't find anybody for that who was suitable, so they offered me the job. And the day I started, someone from that interview panel told me it was because of my reply, you can't ask me that. They thought, ooh, she's going to be bolshy. And, of course, you can discriminate against somebody who's a Bolshevik if you want to. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyway, I didn't yeah. stay in that job very long because yeah. AIT offered me... Because you're too Bolshe, probably. <laughs> <laughs> hey, um, you recently had Sal Grover out. Um, mm. I've done a podcast with her. Um, and um, so if people want to hear about her, just go to that podcast. I'll link it in the show notes. I'll also link the Law Commission um, report in the show notes as well. Um, and I just want you to, to, to finish off, I just want you to talk about um, what happened in New Plymouth because mm. you, you were booked at a public um, a venue and what, what happened? So before I get to that I'll just tell you why we bought Sal Grover over here. Yeah. So as people who have listened to the podcast would know that Sal had started a women only app and unbeknownst to her uh, that in, because Australia has put gender identity and expression into their Sex Discrimination Act, um, that gave an opening for men who wanted to identify as women to come on that women-only app. And so one of them, a man by the name of Roxy Tickle, uh, lodged a complaint with the Human Rights Commission in Australia, and this is exactly what we're worried about here, this sort of thing happening. And anyway, the upshot of it is, is that Sal was the one complained about, so had to crowdfund over half a million dollars to defend uh, the question of what is a woman, because Sal correctly claims that women, that men cannot be women. Okay, so because the Law Commission was in the process of looking at putting gender identity and expression in our legislation, using the exact same meanings, um, to referring to appearances and behaviours, but also adding names and pronouns to our one in terms of a bill that was before Parliament just before the last election. So we wanted to bring Sal over here to get people aware of the danger of putting gender identity and expression in our legislation. And so we booked her into a number of uh, venues in Auckland, New Plymouth, Wellington and Christchurch. New Plymouth because her father comes from New Plymouth and she wanted to catch her up. Nana, her nana's her in New nana, Plymouth. Yeah. Yeah, in New Plymouth. So we added New Plymouth. And also because when I was in New Plymouth earlier, they heard Sal Grover was coming, the, our members said, oh, make sure she comes to New Plymouth. So anyway, we... Uh, we became aware because I, I booked the venue, no problem. They, what was the venue? The venue was the community house, which is run by the women's, uh, women's, oh, I can't remember the name of it, but the women's so, organisation. So is that, is that a, a, a private community group or is that actually a public community group? Well, the venue is owned, I think, by the council. Right, okay. But run by the Women's Resource Centre. Okay, yeah. And the, so, so essentially it's a public yeah. uh, venue. 
and the Citizens Advice Bureau, which is within, you know, has a space within that resource centre, is the one that ha manages the bookings. So I had initially booked for uh, the large room on the on the particular day, and they rang me up just a few days before and said, "Oh, someone else wants that room." Um, uh, do you still want it? And I said, look, I, I, we're only probably going to have about 10 people, so we'll take a smaller room. So they said, oh, yeah, that's fine. The next day, I got this email saying, sorry, you have cancelled your booking. And um, So you have cancelled or they, they have did. That, The Citizens so that, Advice Bureau. They said they have cancelled the booking. They cancelled our booking. And they cancelled it because of the, of the risk to uh, their staff of uh, having you know something well, having put, having some women talk talking yeah. talking in a small room because some people might come and protest about it because right. it was publicly notified but we didn't actually say in our notification events that it was at the CAB uh, because it was actually in the community house hmm. so the CAB was not identified but they decided that the, in the email they told us they didn't want to be identified with our our uh, our meeting, right? So, um, so they, they they specifically wanted to distance themselves from a group of women talking about women's rights. Exactly. So I tried to contact them and they didn't respond to me, both in New Plymouth and nationally, and they never have responded to me. And so I handed the issue over to the Free Speech Union to take up, and they have. There's been quite a lot of correspondence between the lawyers for the Citizens Advice Bureau and from the Free Speech Union. In the meantime, I went ahead and booked another venue. Mm -hmm. Didn't tell anybody where it was, and because we had uh, issued tickets for the Selgrover event, I had the email addresses of everybody who was going to be in attendance. And on the morning of the meeting, I advised them by email where it was. And, and that's less than perfect because a couple of people um, missed out on seeing that email and went to the wrong venue. So mm. that's... But the, the, point, the point being is essentially you were cancelled mm. from a public, uh, a public venue for expressing normal, legitimate, democratic speech. So then we became aware that they were, uh, the trans allies were also trying to get um, our other venues cancelled. Mm. So one of them um, was uh, a pub in Auckland, so I rang the manager of the pub and he said, no, they're not paying for it, I don't care who has my mm. <laughs> mm. is in my venue, and there was no protest there. So then in New Plymouth, uh, only the people who knew about it were present, and uh, and any protesters. I think that one of the people that bought a ticket that day was one of the protesters mm -hmm. trying to find out where yeah. we were. Yeah. And then um, the next venue was in Wellington at Victoria University. Um, they've got a really large building called Rutherford House that I've been in numerous meetings in before on a range of subjects. And, um, and so they had we had arrangements to book a room we had arrangements to go and do sound testing that afternoon of that meeting and then we saw on social media that the trans allies were planning we knew they were planning to protest outside the building and we had talked to security at uh, Victoria University and uh, well, the man that was doing the booking for us, and he said he'd talk to security and that the doors would be shut, that the doors shut automatically at six o'clock and then we could just let people in who were ticket holders. Yeah. And so I was not bothered. I don't care if they want to protest outside Rutherford House. Um, but what we learnt on that, that afternoon of the meeting that they planned to come inside the building using their student IDs and make such a hell of a din that the meeting would have to close down because we wouldn't be able to hear the speakers. And also putting our members in um, a fear of their personal safety. Um, so because they're well aware of what happened at Albert Park, which had sent a real chill. This was our first 
time as a women's rights party that we had attempted publicly notified meetings. So we had already notified the police that we were going to have this meeting and I must say they were less than helpful. We didn't get to speak to an actual police officer, only the non-commissioned people at the desk. And they said they would send their community team um, around to check out that everything was okay, which was not what we expected really. Um, and then, what would you say? You, you, well, you, expect, you, would, you expect more? You would expect that they would be um, making sure that the protesters would stay on the other side of the street, outside it's the actually, building. It's, it's actually their role. That, that's what I would have thought. Mm. <laughs> but Especially given, given the context of the Posey Parker. Exactly. It wasn't just, you know, these, these people have had um, a history. Yes, mm. and we're well aware that Wellington is quite uh, a stronghold for trans allies yeah. um, in relation to Victoria University, which... So, so what happened? Did you had to move the event? Well, no. On, on that day, we already had a backup mm -hmm. at okay. another venue, which I'm not going to name. Yeah. And um, because they had sensitivity about being associated, they did, not because they didn't want to associate with the Women's Rights Party, but they didn't want protesters. Mm. And that's fair enough. So, um, so we had actually, we actually um, got a call from the university security, campus security, telling us that, uh, that they had talked to the uh, people who were going to be protesting and that they were, had promised that they were going to behave themselves, basically. And I said, well, no, they're not, because we've seen their posts on social media. They're going to come in and they're going to make a huge noise. And she said, well, they're entitled to, because they're students, they're entitled to come in. I said, at any hour of the day or night, like three o'clock in the morning, and make a hell of a noise? I don't think so. I said, we had notified the police. And she said, the police can't come into that building without permission from Victoria University. So I thought, this is extremely dodgy. So what we did is we, uh, my partner went up at 3.30 at the allotted time for the sound checks and the audio. And just as if we were going ahead with the meeting, meantime, I was in the, um, in the pub emailing all the ticket holders and telling them to come an hour earlier. It was like the little piggies going to the market at five o'clock instead of six o'clock at this alternate venue. So the protesters turned up and we had somebody over there spying. They, um, they thought they started having a party because uh, they thought we weren't, that we had cancelled the event. And so they were in rainbow euphoria at having successfully cancelled the party. And then at six o'clock, we don't know how, but we suspect the police actually probably notified them that we were at another venue. So then um, some of them left, but others of them went on the hunt to find us. So meantime, our meeting had started. People had been arriving from five o'clock. It was now six o'clock, the meeting was underway. We heard them all outside. They had found where we were, so that tells me somebody who knew, and no one knew except the people who were ticket holders who were inside the venue. Um, and so, and also, as soon as this thing happened with New Plymouth, we can we we um, we closed off ticket sales for Wellington. So nobody who was a trans activist would be able to buy tickets. Mm. Um, once they started trying to cancel our venues because we just said, that's it, no more ticket sales. Mm. So anyway, um, so, so we turned off the lights of the lobby of this building. The, um, the doors were locked and, um, and we just continued in the meeting, turned up the speaker system and continued with our, and they continued to yell and scream outside for about less than half an hour and then they it was bitterly cold outside we were lovely and warm we had the heaters on we'd been in there you know since about 4 30 with the light with the heaters on so we were warm they were outside very cold and um and so our meeting proceeded but we were actually we yeah, think it's so, quite yeah. funny yes but nevertheless mm. you're again you're all, all you're doing is expressing um your de democratic rights to, to speak legal free speech 
um, you're not a bunch of radicals, you're not a bunch of crazies, um, you're actually concerned with what particularly the left has been concerned with um, basically all my lifetime, which is women's rights. And yet you're being um, ignored by the police, it seems. You've been shunned by public institutions and, um, and senior ministers of the Crown in the Labour Party have come out essentially against you, what you're talking about. Um, so it's not good. Um, and, and it's quite disappointing, really. What, what do you, just you know, just to finish off, are you optimistic that the tide is turning on what I would call this rather rather irrational ideology? Well, one would have hoped that the incidents at the Olympic Games with the two mailboxes would have piqued uh, people, and particularly in New Zealand, where sport is so important in our culture. And, um, but what we found uh, is that when people have been putting up information on social media, it is predominantly women who are arguing against us and saying, don't be so mean. Now, I need to be really clear that nobody I know has been critical of the two boxes in a mean and nasty way. What we have been aiming our dissatisfaction with is at the IOC, the Olympic Committee, for failing to, pro for, to protect women's sports, and in particular, putting women boxers at risk of serious injury, potentially fatal injury. Because we know from um, what we've read that the punch of a male boxer is 162% times stronger than a woman boxer of in the same weight category. Mm. And the funny thing about that is that uh, while everybody accepts that we can have weight categories, age categories, that we can stop doping and we can test for testosterone levels to, um, to stop people cheating by taking um, performance enhancing drugs, a lot of women in particular don't see how important it is to um, have eligibility criteria enforced through evidence-based testing. And that's really disappointing. So I'm not sure. Uh, I think that this, in, this Law Commission review which was re requested by uh, the Justice Minister under the Labour government, Kitty Allen is the one who referred it to the, just to the Law Commission. Um, there is a bill um, currently from the previous government, but still there, from uh, Dr Elizabeth Kitty Kitty of the Greens to put gender identity and expression into the law. And, you know, we talked before about defining gender. In, in that bill of Elizabeth Kerry Kerry, it, it says that it means names, pronouns, appearances, mannerisms. Now tell me what appearances and mannerisms that people who are transgender have. They don't even distinguish between men who identify as women and women who identify as men. And in fact, in a, um, in a public sector, policy about gender diverse employees, it actually has a list of uh, appearances associated with transgenderism and these li this list includes nail polish, um, uh, wearing your hair long or short, <laughs> um, wearing makeup or no makeup. And so it's all it's pretty clear it's then. Bizarre. <laughs> the list so, could apply to anybody. Yeah. Yeah, so it is, um, my, hu my humble thoughts, it is madness on steroids. Um, hopefully you're, you're, what you, you're doing with your party um, is going to make a difference. And uh, yeah, I wish you the best of luck and thank you for coming on the podcast. Thank you. To help The Shape of Dialogue grow, please subscribe, like and comment and share it to all and sundry. Many thanks.